Good. Good evening, everybody. We've got a few more people coming in, and I know that there are some folks who will be coming in a little bit later, so if we have room towards the back for them to be seated, that would be terrific. Uh, and before I do anything else, for those of you who are wondering and who checked on your way in, the score is still 2-0, Mariners, just so you know. And I got to tell you, it's warmer here than it is at the ballpark right now, I'm sure. So welcome, everybody, uh, to the Humphrey School, and welcome to this commemoration and dedicated dedication of our newly named Joan and Walter Mondale Commons just outside these doors. This is uh, the most public and oftentimes during the academic year the liveliest part of the school, and it is apt that we dedicate and name this space in honor of such an incredible couple. Joan and Walter Mondale. I'm Laura Bloomberg. I'm the Dean of the Humphrey School of Public Affairs, and I am delighted to see so many people here tonight. We're joined by members of our Dean's Advisory Council, including our Dean's Advisory Council Chair, Chief Judge Jack Thunheim. We're joined by members of the University of Minnesota Board of Regents. I believe Abdul Omari is here, as is Regent Peggy Lucas. We are joined by Mrs. Karen Kaler, and President Kaler will be joining us shortly, and you'll be hearing from him in the second half of this evening's program. And we're also joined by Humphrey School students and faculty and staff, alumni, current and former elected officials from across the state of Minnesota, and many, many people who care deeply about the Mondales and who care deeply about the Humphrey School's mission of advancing the common good in a diverse and changing world. And of course, we're joined this evening by our distinguished guest of honor, Mr. Walter Mondale, who is down in front. And you will hear from him also in the second half of this evening's program. We're also joined by his sons, Ted and William. Often at the Humphrey School, we convene academic panels and we invite in lecturers, we invite in distinguished professionals to talk about timely public affairs matters of the day. Um, we also oftentimes host receptions and parties and networking sessions where people can get together and eat good food and share ideas, network with each other and get to know each other better. Tonight, we're going to do both. We're going to start with a panel discussion and then invite all of you into the Joan and Walter Mondale Commons to do what the Commons was designed to, to, to host, have a networking session and get to know each other better. The conversation tonight is really, this first part of the evening's commemoration is really about a person who is able to join us tonight only in spirit, and that is Joan Mondale, who we lost in 2014. We're here because we want to shine a bright light on something she did so beautifully in her public life and in her private life, and that is to explore the arts and then publicly think about how the arts can help us advance the common good in a diverse and changing world. We want to shine a bright light on the exquisite example that she gave to the world. Um, and in honor of her work, we want to bring together tonight people who can talk about contemporary examples and instances of how the arts and public policy, this whole arena of cultural diplomacy, can advance the kind of work that we're going to do in the world. Um, before I introduce our moderator, I want to share with you something that I've been thinking a lot about, and just recently I went back online and listened to this whole talk. A few years ago, the Smithsonian launched a public exhibit, some of you may have seen it, many of you probably read about it, um, of former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright's pin collection. Many of us remember the pins that she always wore. And they asked her at the opening of this exhibit to speak, and she didn't speak about her pins. She chose to speak about the arts and public policy and the whole realm of cultural diplomacy. And you can go online and hear her talk. It's beautiful. And it really speaks to what we want to be talking about tonight in, in memory of and in honor of Joan. And she, wrote, she said this in her comments. Cultural diplomacy is a crucial part of our diplomacy toolbox. We try to show who we are by the kind of art we create. And we are able to inspire people and, at the same time, learn a lot about other people's culture by seeking to better understand the art that they produce. 
That's what our panel will discuss this evening. So I'm delighted to introduce our moderator to you, Jay Coles. Jay is a, has a distinguished career, as many of you know, in um, investment in the nonprofit arena and certainly is a, part, a significant part of his own family's business, the Coles Media Company. But Jay is here tonight in a different capacity, both in his capacity as a tremendous supporter of the arts in this community and this state, and also in his capacity as a tremendous supporter of the Humphrey School. Jay serves on our advisory council. He has graciously agreed to serve on the campaign committee. We just recently launched a campaign. And as much as I want to stand up here and give you a big campaign, Pitch, I, I won't do that, um, but I would be happy to talk with you afterwards in the, in the comments. And since I have become dean, since I became dean last summer, Jay has also been a tremendous mentor to me. When I asked him to serve on uh, this panel as moderator, he graciously agreed, and, I, and, and he, was, he was gracious about it. Those of us here in the office were absolutely delighted because he will do such a remarkable job. Um, it's apt that we invite Jay to the podium in this space outside the Joan and Walter Mondale Commons, but a space that is named in honor and in memory of members of his own family. We sit in the John and Elizabeth Bates Coles Auditorium, and I think that's just a perfect way to start this evening. So please welcome to the podium, Jay Coles. Uh, thank you, Dean Bloomberg. It's, uh, it's really an honor to uh, participate in this uh, commemoration event today and, and to be part of honoring two of our leading role models in American politics. Tonight's topic uh, feels uh, highly relevant to me, but perhaps that's because I've lived in a world filled with both artistic expression uh, and also public service. We are sitting, as Laura said, in the Coles Auditorium that my grandfather and grandmother, John and Betty, uh, contributed to the Humphrey. Uh, and the MIA, who's going to be represented tonight uh, by Matthew Cox, has a number of outstanding artworks from my grandparents' personal collection. My father, John, was one of the founders of the Guthrie Theater, also going to be represented by Kara Martinez, whom you'll meet in a moment. And he also stewarded quality journalism and the elimination of discrimination all of his life. My mother was a modern dancer with a rich and varied career, inspiring the naming of the Cole Center for Dance and the Performing Arts, even as she carried a lifelong torch for equity and inclusion. And my personal efforts have included helping found the Open Book Center for Literary and Book Arts here just down the street as well as helping found the Itasca Project, a regional leadership effort to maintain our economic competitiveness and quality of life. So for me, art provides heart to our shared experiences and connects the individual human experience to the larger social, cultural, and political context. This, I think, is the genius that was understood and nurtured by Walter and Joan Mondale and that we celebrate today. Walter Mondale, of course, was the elected face of this partnership, and he carved a host of deeply influential furrows in our political landscape. I will not attempt to do justice to your legacy tonight. But our panel discussion will focus on the shared recognition by both Walter and Joan that art, like politics, is a medium of communication within and between societies a medium that brings humanity, emotion, and authenticity into our public realm. This shared understanding, inspired and carried steadily and graciously by Joan over her lifetime, was a trademark of the Mondale's impact on the world. So let me bring Joan briefly into the room tonight. Joan, nicknamed Joan of Art, for her tireless enthusiasm and curiosity about many art forms, studied art as a McAllister student, and soon after graduation worked as a guide at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, and then as a docent and lecturer at our MIA here in town. See, I'm practicing MIA. 
Once she became a senator's wife in Washington, Joan became a guide at the National Gallery of Art, and their home was a showcase of contemporary American art uh, featuring such luminaries as uh, Robert Rauschenberg, Edward Hopper, Louise Nevelson, uh, Klaus Oldenburg, and many others. Joan served as chair of the Federal Council on Arts and Humanities and developed a special passion for making pottery herself, which grew during the Mondale ambassadorship in Japan. There, Joan used art as a highly visible form of sharing aesthetics and cultural values and deepened the bonds of friendship between Japan and the United States in the midst of Walter's difficult and critical political challenges. And so, we'll spend a few moments this afternoon reflecting on art as inspiration for the common good. And we're honored to have three wonderful panelists, and I'm going to introduce them very briefly. Please come to the stage and take a seat as I call your name. First, Matthew Welch, Deputy Director and Chief Curator at MIA, Minneapolis Institute of Arts. Kara Martinez, Director of Community Engagement, Guthrie Theater, and Roderick Cox, Associate Conductor, Minnesota Orchestra. And I'm going to begin with each of our panelists giving a brief introduction of themselves and their work and their reflections on our topic. I have a few prepared questions, but I hope to leave some time for some written questions so there was an opportunity to pick up a pen and paper, I think, outside before you came in, and the staff will be collecting any questions you have. You can raise your hand in the air, and uh, someone will come collect those, and we'll see if we have time at the end for some of those. So I'm going to move on over. And uh, Matthew, I'll just tell you, uh, I'll let you begin while I'm getting my seat, but think about this. As soon as I find my spot. <laughs> You had a chance to work closely with Joan, and I know your specialty, I think, or one of them is Japanese art in particular. So as you introduce yourself and think about Mia's perspective on art as inspiration for the common good, also tell us about Joan's perspective and what she was trying to achieve. Okay. So uh, again, my name is Matthew Welch. I'm uh, the uh, Deputy Director and Chief Curator at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. And it's an institution that I've been at for the last 28 years. It doesn't seem possible, uh, but in, in a changing capacity. I joined the staff uh, in 1990 as the assistant curator of Japanese art, hired from, uh, from Kyoto, Japan, where my wife and I were living. Uh, I was finishing my PhD in, uh, in Japanese art history uh, at Kyoto University. And so I encountered a collection uh, that was sort of unsung at the institution, uh, very rich holdings in some areas, uh, and I had the sum total of one gallery to display uh, Japanese art in. Um, so part of my mission over the last uh, 28 years has been to increase the presence of Asia uh, in this cultural institution, and I'm happy to report that uh, we now have 36 galleries devoted to mm. Asian art. <laughs> so I prevailed. My director accuses me of <laughs> wanting to turn it into the Minneapolis Institute of Japanese Art. But yes. It's not true. Uh, Mrs. Mondale, I met very early on, uh, I think within the first year or two. Uh, she had served as a docent at the museum, uh, remembered very fondly which gallery she toured. She was particularly fond of Egypt, uh, but particularly as Mr. Mondale became uh, the ambassador to Japan, uh, she reached out to me for uh, some advice about um, how to live in Japan, uh, uh, and so on. I can safely say this, and those of you that attended her service uh, heard this repeatedly. Uh, the Japanese um, very much respected, uh, appreciated, uh, and liked Mr. Mondale, but they adored Mrs. Mondale. <laughs> uh, it was a, there was a collective sadness uh, in the country when she left. And part of that was uh, her association with art. She believed very fervently that uh, art was for the people, it was for everyone, it should be uh, accessible by everyone. Uh, and so it's no mistake that uh, she was a potter herself and that she was particularly taken uh, with you know, what became a kind of movement uh, in Japan, the minge movement, the so-called folk art movement. Uh, started in the early uh, 1930s and was championed by uh, people like Shoji Hamada and Kawaii Kanjiro and the Englishman Bernard Leach. 
Uh, and the idea behind this was that, uh, you know, to return our focus to handmade, uh, handcrafted objects in, in an age of industrialization. How many of you grew up eating your dinners off of Malmac plates, for example, that were mass produced? There's no humanity in that. And so she wanted us to remember that things were produced by people. And she then, again, in her very humble way, began to produce them herself. Uh, and when she went to Japan, uh, she did something really extraordinary, I think, where most diplomats' wives send, you know, somebody off to pick up a Baccarat vase or something like that uh, as a gift. She gave objects that she had created herself. And I think that was particularly meaningful and had great resonance among the Japanese people. So, uh, long introduction, but the, uh, that, that was my uh, association with Mrs. Mondale. Good, that's wonderful. Thank you, Matthew, very much. Uh, Roderick, uh, your organization, the Minnesota Orchestra, has an extraordinary trip plan coming up later this year. And I suspect it, it is, uh, in some fashion, an outgrowth of, of how the orchestra sees the connection between its art and its mission and contributing in a larger fashion to the common good. And do you, can you comment on that? Can you give us some of your perspective? Good evening, everyone. I'm Roderick Cox, uh, Associate Conductor for the Minnesota Orchestra, and I've been in my role since uh, June 2015. Part of my uh, job is to serve under the music director, Osmo Vanska, as cover conductor for um, him and other guest conductors. I conduct uh, classical subscription concert, um, education concerts, community engagement concerts, special event concerts, and state tours. And so mm -hmm. um, working as an ambassador to the community is, is also a very important part of my role. And yes, the, 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 um, the event that Jay is alluding to is the announcement of the Minnesota Orchestra's South African tour that's happening this August, um, it was announced last month, and this is a pretty um, special tour because it is the first time an, a major orchestra has has gone to South Africa, and uh, and it's very abnormal for an organization like ours. But we feel that it, in terms of our cultural and musical exchanges, um, it is an opportunity for us to perform a new commission piece called. Um, Harmonia Ubuntu by a South African composer whose name is Bangoni uh, Nodana Breen. I think I have that. <laughs> and also, you have this cult, this musical exchange where we'll take members of the Minnesota Chorale, um, and they will also sing alongside South African choristers as well um, in a performance of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony mm. in Johannesburg and in Soweto. And also we've, we've, as a lead up to that tour, we have planned our annual Summerfest concert, I mean, our Summerfest event that starts in July that goes all the way into August centered around music for Mandela. This year will be the uh, centenary of Mandela, uh, who was born July 18th, 1918, I think. And part of that uh, event, the Summerfest event, is centered around themes of peace, freedom, and reconciliation. So this is something that we're, we're very much gearing up for and excited to, to um, to venture on in August. You know, it's never occurred to me until right now, but are the concerts in South Africa to be live streamed or in any way accessible outside of uh, attending the concerts themselves? I do not have that information readily available um, right now, but I, I would hope that NPR would um, probably do something. Well, let's, get to <laughs> well, let's get to where you go. Let's see what we can get started today. Yes. Thank you very much, Roger. Cara. And uh, Cara, you're relatively new in your position. I think you've been here for about 18 months at the Guthrie. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but the Guthrie has uh, a remarkable lineup of plays currently, from Indecent to Familiar, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, which feel very <laughs> culturally relevant. Mm -hmm. how, how does the Guthrie approach, and Joe Hodge, obviously, is the new director, how does he think about the connection between art and contributing to the common good? Yeah. 
Hi, I'm Kara Martinez. I'm the Director of Community Engagement at the Guthrie, and I should mention in this um, uh, moment, a proud alumnus of the University of Minnesota. I did my doctorate here. Um, so thank you, University of Minnesota. <laughs> thank you for those long years. Um, <laughs> Um, my work at the Guthrie is to, in some ways, to actually think about social policy. I oversee all community outreach. I oversee all audience engagement. I program our happening series in which the Guthrie does a thing that it doesn't always do so well, which is to quickly create a piece of art in response to what's happening in our society. Mm -hmm. Um, I oversee our community advisory network, and then I consult a lot on just programming and decision making in general in the building. With the advent of Joe Hodge's leadership, um, I think the core values of the organization have, have shifted focus, and, and two of those core values are community engagement and equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I think what you see in this current season is a kind of awakening in the organization to realize that, that no social policy is neutral. Um, we'll, we'll be doing Ibsen soon as well. Ibsen is not neutral. He has an inherent political, social, economic value. And what you see in a play like Familiar, which is written by Denai Guerrera, who's a graduate of McAllister. She's in Black Panther, um, but her family uh, is from Zimbabwe. What, what you begin to see, I think, in the Guthrie's programming is this awakening understanding that global frameworks live within the community in Minnesota, that people have a varied system of ideas and ideologies which, with which they are processing the work that we put on the stage, and we need to give them richer material that feeds all different kinds of minds and life experiences. And I think that's very much at the center of, of the things that, that Joe wants to begin to think about. And it is it will be a process. That kind of cultural shift and institutional shift is a process in terms of broadening our understanding of how art can engage with social policy. And it's my job to like nudge that along. That's terrific, and I'm sure like, like any human institution, as opposed to an individual artist, you've, you've got to process that dialogue and that relationship with your audiences mm -hmm. through a multitude of channels and, uh, and roles to be played. Thank you for that, and I'll be back to you in a sec. Matthew, I wanted to follow up with you, though, at MIA, uh, particularly with this recent grant that the Andrew Mellon Foundation uh, gave to me a, to establish the Center for, uh, what, what do we call it, empathy? In the visual arts. And the visual arts. <laughs> Does that relate to our topic tonight? Very Is much so. So um, recent research has revealed, and in fact, uh, Kathleen Voss, I'm not sure if she's here, a professor here in the Carlson School, has done research on the human reaction to wonder and awe that is often precipitated by a cultural experience, uh, either in a visual arts organization like mine, theater or music. And that people that uh, find themselves in that moment or in that space find their stress level uh, being reduced, they find themselves more receptive to the ideas of others. Uh, it sort of is the anecdote to everything that we face on our daily, uh, daily basis. And so, uh, Stemming from that, we had this idea of approaching the Mellon Foundation and the Chipstone Foundation in Milwaukee as well uh, to create a kind of uh, center uh, for investigating the impact of the visual arts, uh, in our case, uh, on human empathy. Uh, and so we've just started. There was a think tank held at uh, Berkeley late last year, and then recently another convening with largely the same players, uh, but with our own staff about three weeks ago. Uh, to begin the process, uh, and so bringing back, uh, bringing in thought leaders from across the country, psychologists, storytellers, uh, scientists that study the human brain and neuroscience, to really disentangle uh, what this process is about and how we can foster it in, in the museum's galleries. Uh, it's interesting, you represent different art forms, uh, and Mia in particular is, is visual arts, uh, whereas uh, both Roderick and Kara representing uh, performing arts. Right. Is there, are there challenges, or, or, or I should say, are there partnerships that are uh, occurring to you or to Mia 
in order to bring more of a performance. Uh, and, and in some respects, for Kara and Roderick, are there aspects of the visual that they are adapting in their facilities or in the way in which they're presenting their work also? So I'll come back to them in a sec. But does yeah. that resonate for you at all? Are there emerging it, partnerships? There are emerging partnerships. But more to the point, I think, um, you know, if you look at the museum, we have a over a hundred year history now, um, but it's lar it largely represents a very specific uh, European and Amer colonial American narrative. Um, I think uh, American institutions are the envy of the world in that we, for a very young country, have managed to create incredible um, art museums uh, in massive collections. Think of the Met uh, is on par with the Louvre, for example. Uh, that's extraordinary for a country this young. On the other hand, it represents a very, very narrow view of humanity. Uh, and our challenge now, that's a big ship to turn at this point. Exactly. Those collections have been gathered over the last hundred years. And yet our population is changing very rapidly. Uh, the U.S. Census Bureau reports that by uh, 2060, some 57% uh, of our population will be persons of color. And the reality is uh, those uh, those people are not reflected in the collections that we now house. And so how can we, how can we turn? And the, the, the response is we can't actually turn that quickly when it comes to the collection. It's taken us 100 years to get to where we are. Uh, we can absolutely, and we are addressing those issues, but what we can do is programming. Uh, what we can do is how we interpret those works. So for example, uh, I'll give you a very good example. Uh, the, uh, we have a suite of period rooms. One of them is uh, the Charleston dining room and living room, uh, given to us uh, by Colonel John Stewart, or came from his family. Uh, and this, this room was a setting for uh, furniture that was produced in colonial America. So that's very interesting, and, and of course the decorative arts curator will tell you all about the, the nature and style of the furniture. Uh, but there's another narrative that we can step up to there, and the, the fact is that uh, Colonel John Stewart's wealth came from uh, slaves that worked his plantation and grew rice. Uh, and uh, from his negotiations with Native Americans, including many uh, sort of uh, spurious treaties. And so another way to interpret those rooms or to unpack those rooms or to uh, examine where that wealth came from and what it meant uh, for the development of this country. And, and so while, while we still have the room and that doesn't change, uh, the way we look at that artifact uh, within the context of the museum can be vastly different than it has been. Right, so the, 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 the choice of storytelling or the, uh, the uh, uh, further development of the story that needs to be told is, is a crucial part of, of, of how, and, and part of this is obviously you referenced the census tracts. Uh, we have a, a uh, you know, we're rapidly changing demographic uh, 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 experience here in this state, but uh, in the country as well. Uh, we, we have uh, a, a rapidly diversified uh, sort of media environment which uh, creates lots of uh, messages, a variety of messages that we have not had, I think, in, in, such, uh, in uh, such a multitude. So there's a, it requires, the common good presupposes commonality. That's right. And in some respects, to contribute to a public discourse, presumably, you're inclusive of as much of the public as possible. How do you think about uh, achieving that, and how do you measure success? How do you know that you're accomplishing that part of the role that you want to take on? And I'll throw that open to anybody, Kara or Roderick. How do you know if you're succeeding I think when we make our traditional audiences uncomfortable, we are succeeding. <laughs> if we look at, so the Guthrie has instituted under Joe Hodge's leadership a new hiring policy. Every, every hiring practice, there must be a final pool of, that final pool of candidates must be diverse or the hire will not be made. That goes for actors, every part. It goes for directors, it goes for designers, it goes for people who, who work as, as staff. And what that allows is 
an infusion and a wealth of viewpoints that are shaping the art. So the visual landscape of a play, the set design changes because the lived experience of that designer is different perhaps than what our audience is, is used to seeing. And I think an important part in the theater arts uh, is, is making people uncomfortable. You know, dissonance is productive. To, to, question, to question your privilege, um, to question how you arrived where you are is a, is a beautiful thought exercise. So I think one of the things that we're trying to live with is that, that we're in a state of, of change, and change means discomfort to some extent for some of our audience members. It doesn't mean that we're not going to do Shakespeare, but it does mean that we're going to do Indecent, which is Paula Vogel's uh, Pulitzer Prize nominated play that, that tells a decidedly queer story and a queer history of Jewish folks in, in Europe. And we have to be willing to embrace multiple kinds of stories and multiple kinds of storytellers. And, and, and think together in dialogue about how we're all experiencing the, that intersection in different kinds of ways. I think, um, you know, when, when going on stage or I think my organization's primary goal in terms of impact is not making our audience uncomfortable because right. I think yeah. that can have... Um, uh, it can be a positive and negative effect. I mean, if someone's uncomfortable, they can tighten or retreat or push away. I think we're having our most um, impactful uh, influences when we can open, um, op open the eyes and ears of our audience and even the musicians on stage in, in thinking about our, our strategic plan of, of musical and cultural exchanges through diplomacy, um, through touring and residencies around the globe. Um, after coming back from the, the awful lockout in 2014, we did the the historic tour to Cuba as the first uh, major orchestra to go there after things had started to thaw. Um, and what we learned from that experience is um, this culture exchange is a, is a two-way street. Um, so it's not just us coming to play for um, for a specific place, like normal orchestras would do in terms of going to the, the Music of Rhine in Vienna and the Concertgebouw in Amsterdam and the Philharmonie in, in, in Berlin and playing great concerts of Schubert, Schumann, and Beethoven for audiences. Um, yet we went to Cuba and played music of, of theirs and, and ours and American music as well. So you have the European, you have um, our cultural uh, exchange and theirs as well. And when we sat down to do side-by-side -side rehearsals with uh, their young people, as we're doing in South Africa with residencies at the universities and, and working with the South African National Youth Orchestra and the Cape Town Philharmonic, what we learned during that time was, I mean, our musicians are, are experts on their instruments and some of the best in the world coming from Juilliard and Curtis and all the great in music institutions around the world, um, but they struggled with uh, a a Cuban piece. They struggled with right. Latin rhythms. Yeah, um, I mean, right. Uh, and so, which these young uh, amateur, well, these young student musicians, these rhythms were second nature to them, and they were then went on to teach our musicians Beautiful. how to do those rhythms, and. And, that's the, and that is the epitome of cultural exchange. We're coming back as changed individuals. We've shared something with them, and they've shared something with us. So I imagine it's going to be incredibly um, insightful for us to go to uh, South Africa and have our singers sing next to South African singers that are expert in their traditions, and for us to work on uh, South African music, but us also to play a little Bernstein for them and to play some Beethoven, some of the you know cornerstone pieces of our um, repertoire as well. So I'm 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 really excited and looking forward to that and thinking about the harmonia Ubuntu piece that um, Bengani wrote. Ubuntu is is represents this African value of 
one's humanity is tied to others' humanity. And that's so, imagine if we grew up with that motto in our minds that your humanity is tied to others' humanity. And that doesn't matter. And, and when you think about that, it doesn't matter where they are in the globe. You know, who you are mm -hmm. is very much linked to others. And um, so it, it, this, is, this is a part of our, our new mission, you know, Minnesota Orchestra 2.0 after the lockout, yeah. <laughs> um, that we are, we're trying to continue to, to build upon. But also in our community, um, as well, especially with programs like the the Send Me Hope concert and and Spirit of the Season concert that I uh, conducted following certain traumatic events like the the shootings in 2016 of uh, Anton Sterling and then the shooting um, in November of Philander Castile that was that was a moment of of healing that we wanted to play a part of in our community. It's beautiful, you know. Art, art is as much about healing and uh, uh, providing comfort as it often is about dissonance or challenges to orthodoxy. And uh, so it's got it's got a powerful role. And what I also hear you saying very articulately, Roderick, is is in some respects with a deeply historic canon like classical music, yeah. there's there's a there's a uh, the the process of learning and then in turn communicating uh, more broadly uh, will, will, I don't want to say takes time, but it is, a, it is a complex process. But you're uh, clearly wrapping your work in a much larger story uh, than I think would have been true 10 or 20 years ago, certainly my experience the orchestra. There's a terrific question that I'd like uh, the three of you to answer uh, as you can, or as you wish. How did the Native American Ojibwe challenge to the installation of, I don't even remember the piece? The scaffold. Of, uh, yeah, the scaffold. The scaffold. Yeah. My apologies, at the Sculpture Garden, served to galvanize conversation within your organizations and perhaps change some of your behavior. Uh, or your thinking? Hmm. I'll take um, The Guthrie prior to last summer had never produced a work written by a native person before. It sits on the bank of the Mississippi in a sacred area where the waters are moving. It's a sacred site for those folks. It just so happened that right as the scaffold was taking place, we'd initiated a project with Larissa Fasthorse and Ty Defoe to create a community theater piece in which Native community members were driving the writing, the production, the shape, the form the piece would take. That piece was called Water is Sacred, um, but literally it was the first time Native folks had been able to um, direct their own voices in their own ways at the Guthrie. And, and one of the things we ended up having to do, um, we went down to the protests that were around the scaffold piece and we talked with community members. Um, it just sort of changed the nature of the project in general. How do you allow the space for Native artists to, to voice and um, give form to the consternation they were feeling at that time. Since then, we've continued to work with different Native educators, like trying to hold the space of not imposing the Guthrie's will upon those folks, but asking them how we might be of a resource to their community. And we were recently, last week, um, awarded a grant that would allow us to work again with Larissa and Ty and then several other local Native artists to do a writing project that would then, in the summer of 2019, create another new piece that would be on our proscenium stage. But we have a lot to learn and a lot of work to do. And you know, a total absence of across 50 plus years is a thing that the Guthrie has to grapple with. 
Yeah, it, um, it, Mia, it served to, that incident sort of served to uh, validate both what we were doing and amplify the fact that, um, you know, this is a conversation that, that we must have going forward. Um, you know, we're mounting an exhibition uh, next spring of Native, uh, Native American women artists. Um, many of the objects that you see in museums uh, that go nameless <laughs> were, were produced by women. Uh, we now know this, and so that should at least be noted on the didactic material. But we're, we're creating that exhibition uh, in concert with a community advisory group, um, actually a convening from across the country, mostly of women, mostly of Native, Native women scholars in this area. Uh, and so it, it sort of validated that. Um, we also, at the same time, you know, recently we had a, an exhibition on Martin Luther. Um, this was, a, this was a, a very important figure historically, changed the world, changed the way um, we work these days. Uh, but nevertheless, towards the end of his life particularly, was uh, a terrible anti-Semite. Uh, and so to, I think most museum exhibitions would ignore that fact. That's disturbing, uh, and would just focus on beautiful illuminated Bibles. Uh, uh, but we felt very strongly that we couldn't do that. It's, there's a kind of uh, dishonesty in that these days. Uh, maybe it always was there, but we simply don't have the, the, the latitude to ignore those uh, aspects of the narrative now. And so again, uh, convened an ecumenical group of uh, advisors from the community, uh, to help us uh, to draft a, a, uh, a panel that stepped up to this aspect of Luther. Uh, didn't diminish uh, the exhibition at all. I think it, it gave it greater depth and resonance. Uh, in the end, uh, he was human. Uh, and, and so it steps up to that aspect of, of humanity as well. Well, um, I am, can embarrassingly say that I wasn't on many committees that uh, discuss this specific thing um, that happened. However, I will say that uh, since then the orchestra has been really working on um, this sense of inclusion and um, having different groups of uh, represented on our stage and we established what's called the, the Good Fellowship, um, which is put in place to help motivate Native American musicians to apply for this specific fellowship, this fellowship designed for them. Um, and if they receive this fellowship, they're able to play in our orchestra, get um, training from our musicians, get financial support, um, and also mentorships that will then allow them to be um, successful in our business because um, of that underrepresentation from from that specific group. Um, but it is a you know as as Matthew was saying, it is a very fine line. Um, how do you separate the the art from the the person? Um, you know, especially in, in classical music, I mean, <laughs> there were some pretty flawed composers. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but some of them produce such great music, and um, it's, it's definitely a conversation we all yeah. still um, have to have, even if we're performing a piece like um, Madame Butterfly. Mm -hmm. there, there, right. you know, there are times you will, um, have Japanese protesters for, for such a thing. Um, and there are those artists that refuse to perform works by Wagner, um, who was also um, quite prejudiced in many ways. But yes, yeah, it's, it's a conversation we still have to definitely have as we present such works. Uh, there's a couple of questions uh, really focusing on youth. Uh, the three of you represent institutions that, that uh, in some respects, uh, uh, represent a, a kind of di dominant uh, white cultural norm, uh, which has established the kind of arts landscape and accrued significant resources and assets, mm -hmm. and yet is also rooted in some respects in that history and perhaps does not appear as relevant to the youth today. So can each of you speak about how you're specifically trying, working to connect with youth, all of the youth in our community, and 
Well, I'll, I'll have a follow-up question. There's plenty there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, there's been long-standing museum programs for internships and so on, but, um, but it's, it runs deeper these days. There are specific, uh, there's specific support uh, forthcoming from 3M uh, and recently Best Buy just from Best Buy as of yesterday uh, for youth scholarships, uh, for, for internships within the museum. But also, you know, we're really examining our programming and, and I give, the, the, I think the greatest example which seemed so unlikely to our traditional audience um, was the exhibition At Home with Monsters uh, featuring the work of Guillermo del Toro. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a Mexican filmmaker who was ostracized as a kid uh, so it was very relatable. Uh, he was blonde haired and blue eyes and, and a little on the heavy side. Uh, so grew up really alone. His father had the good fortune of winning the lottery and associated wealth with learning and so proceeded to then buy entire collections of books uh, that he surrounded his child with. And so Guillermo grew up looking at books and he kept every single one of them. Uh, he very proudly has a seven volume set of the history of art that his mother gave him. He also kept um, journals uh, in which he drew the creatures of his imagination, the monsters, uh, and made stories about them. He so prizes these that in this exhibition, it was the last thing that arrived at the museum and they had to be installed himself. Um, he, he personally loaded them into the cases and buttoned down uh, uh, the cases securely. Uh, and those were the things that he came back for too to take away before we began disassembling the show. Uh, the point being that he was an inspiration, I think, to people visiting the, the uh, exhibition because of his success, but also the message that he conveys, and that is often, uh, or what we think of as monsters are not monsters at all. Um, monsters are what they are. They're, they're a little like insects. If they eat something, it's because they're instinctually compelled to do so. The real evil uh, exists in humanity, which is you know, capable of incredible cruelty, as history tells us. And so inevitably, as you watch his films, it's not the creatures that are the problem, uh, it's the people. Uh, and I think that was a, a, a message that particularly resonated with youthful visitors uh, to the exhibition. Terrific, please. Well, um, you, you touched on a couple things there in how we address youth and also being predominantly white institutions. How do we you know, break down those particular barriers? Um, I, we, we have our youth programs, the education concerts, the fellowship programs, and so forth, um, where we, we aggressively reach out to young people. I think the bigger issue that's, that's I think, plaguing most of our art institutions is this, this conversation around diversity and inclusion and so forth. And I think we have to uh, be honest with ourselves and say that we're not really doing enough and working hard enough and, and that people you know, uh, of color and young people want to see themselves represented on stage. So we have to act aggressively in, um, in cultivating those relationships and they have to be sincere. Um, and with any relationship, you can't just do it as if you're just checking something off, checking off of, of a, a box. You have to continuously invest and, and um, keep an open mind, open ears, invite different types of people on your board um, and 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 stretch yourself and stretch your organization and I think is 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 very much healthy in terms of our when you when you program differently when you hire different artists that you're not used to so it requires us to step outside of our comfort zone as well of what we know as professionals and seek um, advice and insight from others that we that we might not be used to playing music that we are not uh, used to playing what makes us uncomfortable and uh, not just working to make our audience uncomfortable and i think um, holistically that will make us all healthier as an organization and as a community joe hodge and i actually talk about this a lot um, we're both from immigrant families, and theater, I think, for both of us was the space when we were acting where you got to practice envisioning yourself in the world in a different way. Mm -hmm. And th that practice is, is a, a beautiful kind of empowerment, and that it can open up an ability to see yourself in new places, um, and, in, and, in, and imagine yourself beyond the scope of where you are, 
in that moment, in your lived reality. The Guthrie brings, so, so that's like a thing that we both believe in, and then we have a, a really amazing education team on top of that. The Guthrie brings through 25,000 students a year for student matinees, and that's great, but it can be transactional, right? They're in, they're out. And so what we've established is the Guthrie Education Network that's led by our Director of Education, Jason Brown. And there are, I believe, eight network schools 10, one of our workers, one of our education people is like, it's 10. <laughs> so there are 10 network schools. And what's, I think, really amazing, I was a school teacher for a lot of years. So what's really amazing about this network is there's a diverse group of teaching artists placed in those schools. And instead of saying to the school, here's what you need um, to have art in your school, the, the question is rather, how might this artist help your math classroom? or your English classroom, or your or gym. Um, so that the school is driving how that, sure. that uh, teacher who has an artistic sensibility is of benefit to that specific environment and allows for more equitable education programming. Mm -hmm. And then great. in general, those schools, when, when they come into the Guthrie, have different kinds of experiences. So this week, um, or rather next week, once Guess Who's Coming to Dinner opens, we'll have an entirety of a high school sit together for one matinee. So they'll, from the custodians, ninth grade through 12th grade, they'll be there, they'll have experience okay. together, the principal's gonna give a talk at the top. Okay. And it, that kind of understanding that students are not ubiquitous, that they have individualized needs and we need to address them it, with the specificity that they have is sort of driving a kind of new approach to education at the Guthrie. That, that's a beautiful example. And uh, we're gonna end on that note, yeah. but I wanna, Thank each of you for, I think, uh, representing uh, your institutions, I think, very genuine, authentic efforts to grow and to address this issue about how art informs the public uh, space, the common good, as it were. Uh, and I want to thank the audience for these excellent questions. I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to get to more of them. I think uh, both Matthew, Cara, and Roderick, all three, are going to be staying around after this uh, discussion uh, at, the, at the event upstairs. Uh, and with that, I'm going to bring this to a close, but I want to thank uh, uh, the three of you. Please give a round of applause for our panel. Thank you. Thank you.